How's everybody doing today? Great. Great. You guys excited about the walk later on? And how many people have never seen me speak before? Show of hands. Yes. Awesome. That means I, I can mold you any way that I want. <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding. My name is Sergey. I am here to talk to you about plants, wild edibles specifically today. But before I get into wild edibles, I just want to give you a brief journey through my life in healthy foods. It started when I was just five years old in Russia. That's where I was born. My family came from there. We started eating super greasy Russian food, which led me to a state of pre-diabetes. And then when we immigrated here in 1990 and saw how much more amazing, decadent food there was in America, that led me to type 1 diabetes. The, the transition from Russia to the States was pretty incredible. In Russia back then, if you went to the store, there was one type of coffee, cabbage, carrots, and vodka and meat, and that's about it. Versus going to Safeway here, where you have 50 types of coffee, 40 different types of cheese, all the meat you could ever dream of, and everything was packaged in boxes. And it seemed so scientific, we thought Americans could not possibly do it wrong, right? So we embraced American culture, started eating traditional, standard American diet, and within three years of being in America, my mom was diagnosed with arrhythmia. Like I said, I got type 1 diabetes, my dad got hyperthyroid and arthritis, and my sister had asthma. So we all got sick. We didn't know what else to do, so we turned to the medical system, and they pretty much told us exactly the same thing. Take these drugs or these pills for the rest of your life, and you'll never get better. <laughs> right? So where's the incentive in that? At nine years old, when I was diagnosed, those were just big words. I didn't really know what was going on. I knew I had some symptoms that were inconvenient. I was constantly going to the bathroom, uh, always thirsty. Sometimes I would faint because my blood sugar got too low. But it didn't really, I didn't comprehend what was going on. So my mom got really worried, and she was the driving force behind why I'm healthy today, and I'm very grateful for my parents. She went to several different doctors, all of which told her that if I have diabetes, I either need a pancreas transplant, which is $50,000, or synthetic insulin for the rest of my life, and I would eventually wear out my liver and need a pancreas transplant anyway, maybe even end up in a wheelchair. And so that, that didn't seem like a good alternative or a good way to solve what was going on. So she started resorting to doing research herself. She went to the bookstore and bought several hundred dollars worth of medical books, read up about diabetes and arrhythmia in those books. They told her pretty much the same thing the doctors told her, that if you have incurable diseases, there's no help for you and you have to take drugs and you have to maintain high paying jobs so that you can afford the insurance, et cetera, et cetera. This is where my mom said, you know what, screw it. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to approach healthy looking people and see if I can just get one on one connected with them and see what they're doing and maybe it'll work for us. So if you could picture this, at the time my mom was huge overweight Russian lady with a thick accent and she would literally like scope somebody running <laughs> down the street and she'd run up to them and she'd be like hello my son has diabetes what can you do to help him why do you look so good and if you can imagine most of those people thought she was nuts and started running even further <laughs> I cannot tell you how badly this embarrassed me. Like it, sometimes I happened to be with my mom when she was doing that. But she kept at it because she noticed this drastic difference between how some people look. Some people she thought looked very vibrant and full of life force, and other people looked like they were on their last leg of life. So she approached those people that looked good and asked, those the, asked them those questions. Of course, the more she failed, the better the more she learned and perfected her method. She learned that if you ran up to them, instead of just jumping in with the diabetes or the arrhythmia, if you just said, ooh, you look good. What do you do that looks so good? Then they'd open up and they'd kind of melt 
They wouldn't get freaked out, and then she could fire off the diabetes question. Believe it or not, this worked. One day when we were, when my mom was at a bank in Denver, Colorado, she asked this lady that looked radiant, the lady turned around and she said, I know one thing that'll change all of your guys' lives. It doesn't matter the condition. And she told my mom about raw food. She said, eat fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, and grains. Don't cook anything. And that's all you have to do. And that just sounded so simple and kind of so stupid that we all got disappointed. We were like, eat like rabbits and that'll solve stuff. But eventually, we decided that it was our only option, and so my mom went, destroyed the microwave with a hammer, and threw away all of our TV dinners, and replaced everything with a bowl of fruit and vegetables. She didn't really ask the kids or my father when she did this, but she, she knew that this, something needed to change, and this was a, a great way to do it. And of course, we all freaked out at first. I was like, Mom, this is crazy. There's a couple vegetarian kids at my school, and they're getting ridiculed as it is. Can you imagine if I come in and I say, hey, I only eat raw food, what people are going to think about me? I also said, give me the shots. I'd rather eat pizzas and take insulin shots than eat fruits and vegetables. She did something completely unexpected. She sat me down, and she explained to me in kid-friendly terms what it meant to have diabetes. She said, look you probably want to live a long, healthy life. You probably have dreams and aspirations uh, that require a working body. And if you don't change something, if you don't deal with this diabetes, you might not be able to realize some of your dreams. You might live less. You might die sooner. And that got through to me. I don't want to die. And so I decided, what the heck, I'll just try it. And that's what worked. Within a couple of weeks, my symptoms started going away. At first, in fact, all of our symptoms started going away. The arrhythmia, the arthritis, the asthma. And at first we thought, this, this has got to be a placebo, right? I mean, if this works so well, why aren't hundreds of thousands of people doing it? I'm still trying to answer that question. I don't really know. But it, the bottom line is it worked. I've been with di diabetes free for 17 years now. Uh, my mom and dad are in, in good health, and same with my sister. And we basically started traveling around and sharing our experience because people wanted to know. And some people had already exhausted the medical path and wanted an alternative. And somewhere along that journey, because we were already on the extreme bandwagon, my mom decided, why not hike from Mexico to Canada on the Pacific Crest Trail? It's only 2,650 miles, <laughs> roughly six months worth of hiking. We, we attended this trail meeting uh, for the PCT, the Pacific Crest Trail Association, and there we heard stories from people who had done the trail, and they were just like really amazing. Their eyes were sparkling. They couldn't wait to go back. And so we decided that prior to hiking the six-month hike, we were going to just do a seven-day hike just to see how we weathered. Well, we failed horribly. <laughs> My parents decided, oh, well, hiking backpacks are so expensive, we don't actually need them. We'll just take military rucksacks and stick our arms through the handles. We didn't have lightweight anything. In fact, my dad brought like a mini sledgehammer for putting the tent stakes in. And when my mom, at the end of the seven days, still said, hey, I, I still want to do this trail, my dad started crying. <laughs> because they say in Russia, the man is the head of the household, but the woman is the neck, so wherever the neck turns, the head has to go, right? And he knew that <laughs> if she was still determined to hike this trail, we were doing it. Well, that day approached. Uh, we were going to leave in April, April 14th, 1998. Start at the Mexican border and make our way slowly up the west coast through California, Oregon, and Washington, and hopefully end up at the, uh, the Canadian border. Now when you're hiking for six months, you can't pack that much food on your back, right? So what we read in a book is that you have to make yourself food parcels 
and then send them to yourself general delivery so that every 100 miles when you walk through that little town, you could grab that box of food, throw it in your backpack, and keep going. So we were in Southern California getting prepped. It took us a couple months to gather up enough food. We uh, went and did some work trade with the date people, and they hooked us up with about uh, five to 10 dates per person per day, and then we volunteered at a couple other farms, and then we used what little money we had to, got, to buy nuts and seeds and rolled oats. And we filled our friend's garage with all this food, which I spent many hours taping and repackaging into little boxes that we la later mailed. And like I said, we'd only hiked that one seven-day hike before, so we really didn't have any prior knowledge to how much five hungry hikers could eat. Oh, by the way, the fifth hiker was my cousin. My uncle sent her to live with us for a year from Russia because he thought, it will be nice for this young girl to get a well-rounded <laughs> American experience, right? <laughs> Little did she know, she came into this family that for six months of that experience would be hiking in the forest. So we packaged our food, our friend dropped us off at the Mexican border, and uh, we started hiking. And after about a mile, we stopped to take a rest because we were t really tired. And we realized that all these games and all these things that we uh, brought to occupy our time were way too heavy. So we started throwing our excess junk out. Um, our friend had followed us, luckily, so we, we unloaded them in his car to the point where we actually cut the handles off our toothbrushes because we wanted to save as much weight as possible. So we just had the little bristles. And we hiked and, and we ate, and pretty soon we ate all of our food. And it took us two more days to hike on empty stomachs to get to the next post office to pick up our uh, food parcel. So we picked it up and thought, mm, maybe we should ration it out ba better so that it'll last longer. We tried, and again, we ran out of food before we got to the next post office. And this was a little bit alarming. You know, it's not, it's not very much fun to fast as it is, let alone when you're exerting yourself physically hiking through the mountains. And the Pacific Crest Trail especially is called the Pacific Crest because you end up hiking up all the tallest crests on the west coast. So you walk down to the lowest points and then tallest points and pretty soon it got pretty bad. We were uh, needing more calories and we were faced with the decision, do we quit the trail? because we don't have enough food, or do we find some way to improvise? And we did the, this trail on the cheap. We, you know, we didn't have thousands of dollars to go out and just buy more food. It was either you improvise or you quit. And during one of these serious discussions, um, we were just uncertain. We were sharing our thoughts. The great thing about our family dynamic is my parents would always include us in the decision-making process. Even though we were young, I was 13 years old, they would always sit my sister, my cousin, and I down and say, hey, what do you guys want to do? What do you think we should do? Do you want to continue hiking? And it felt very nice as a kid to be part of that decision-making process. So during one of these times we were sitting, we had a, a talk and basically said, hey, you know, it looks like we're going to have to quit. My mother then went to this, uh, a nearby stream to wash her face, and she noticed a plant that looked very similar to celery. She picked it, she smelled it, it smelled just like celery. And we knew better to, than to eat things out in the wild, uh, so we brought it, she brought it back and we all kind of investigated it. My dad was the boldest, he said, you know what, I'll try a little piece and if I die, It'll be the, le the least amount of blow to the family because I don't speak English anyway, and <laughs> all of you guys do. That's uh, black Russian humor, by the way. <laughs> so he tried a little bit, and after 15 minutes, he was still alive, so he tried a little bit more. It was a very long, tedious process, but we did determine that it was actually wild celery. And two days later, when we were in the next town, we were walking by a used bookstore and saw a copy of Wild, like a Wild Edible book by uh, Lee Allen Peterson. It was like one of the original books on Wild Edibles. So we picked it up for a couple bucks and we started flipping through the pages and sure enough identified what we had eaten as wild celery. 
Also, while flipping through the pages, we noticed a lot of the plants that we'd been hiking by, you know, as edible plants, and it told us how to use them and how nutritious they, they were. So we had another family meeting and decided, hey, let's give this another shot. Let's hike the next seven days trying to incorporate some wild edibles in our diet, see how we feel, and see if we can continue. And that was really when the trail started for us, because as scary as it seemed at the time, that kind of opened a whole new world of opportunity for me. Our diets became so bountiful, so diverse, so delicious, that hiking became a joy. Basically, all the food in, that we had packed in the packages would last so much longer because up to 70% of our diet was coming from the trail. We were eating things like wild onions, wild celery, wild mustard, radish, horseradish, uh, different berries. You know, there's like 15 different berries that we ended up finding. Uh, malva, <laughs> just you name it. And some of those things we'll actually encounter today. We hiked this trail. It was amazing. We connected with nature like never before. We actually all cried when we ended because it, it, it got there sooner than we had ever expected. And in recent years, I've actually been contemplating the idea of soloing the trail again just to get that piece of the experience. And who knows? We'll see. But basically, we got back into civilization and kind of put wild edibles on the back burner. Went back to touring around and talking about raw foods and talking about how we healed ourselves of these health ailments. And to make a long story short, we actually started running into pitfalls within raw food eating. For example, we started uh, experiencing energy lulls. Like every day at two or three in the afternoon, we'd all feel super tired. And our diet, we thought, was as pure as it could ever be. We were eating raw fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and grains. I started developing some cavities in my teeth, which was another alarming sign that maybe I wasn't doing something right. Uh, my dad's hair started turning gray. My mom started gaining some of her weight back. And we had these burning questions. What's going on? Why is it what was working for us before isn't working as well now? So we started contacting various raw food experts and asking them, what's up? Like, what do we do to fix this? And some said, eat more goji berries. It's as simple as that. Or eat more chocolate. Others said, don't eat sprouts. Others said, eat a lot of nuts. Others said, don't eat nuts at all. You see where I'm going with this? So we started following all these expert opinions until one day we had nothing left to eat. And we still felt some of these signs of less than perfect health. My mom then again decided to take matters into her own hands and start doing research. And from that research, green smoothies were born. She basically found that the typical diet worldwide is low in nutrition, right? And that greens, out of all the foods she looked into, had the highest nutrition. And even as raw foodists, we weren't eating enough greens because fruits are sweeter and they're more accessible. Uh, they're more colorful. Greens are bitter. They're tough to chew. Why else don't we eat greens? Anybody out there? Can, can you help me? Bitter, hard to chew, maybe not socially acceptable, right? Picture this. If you come to work and during lunch you open an apple and you eat it, Nobody says a, a thing. But come the next day and open uh, your little pouch, grab a piece of lettuce or a head of lettuce and just start munching on the lettuce. What are your coworkers going to think? <laughs> it's not as tasty, yeah. So even as raw foodists, we weren't eating enough greens. And so we started packing our diet full of greens, blending green smoothies, which for those of you who might not know, it's just a smoothie that's 60% fruit, 40% greens by volume. You could tweak the ratio depending on how much you do or don't like fruit. And reverse those signs of less than perfect health. And like I said, you know, that, that fixed all those problems. At this point, I was in my 20s. I was kind of going off on my own. And somehow, the wild edible knowledge that I learned from the PCT 
sparked up again. It was like something I put away and kind of forgot about. And then I, I was like, whoa, as healthy as greens are for us, I bet wild edibles are even healthier. I mean, most of them are actually green, right? If you think of wild plants, most of those plants are greens. And so now we're kind of moving into the benefits of wild edibles. And I said it, there, that's the first one thing, is that wild edibles are green, and greens are full of minerals and chlorophyll and vitamins in such high concentrations that it's nature's free superfood. Sometimes you go to the store and, you know, they try and sell you these little things in bottles. And I think there's a time and a place for supplements. Like, for example, if you're traveling a lot, if you're on airplanes all the time, and accessing salads or fresh foods is not possible, then I think maybe adding supplement to your water might be a good idea. But as a general practice within my family, we've never taken any kind of supplements. I mean, we've, we've experimented with them, but it's never proven to be helpful. It's just been kind of a money drain. So I believe that the only natural superfoods are just that. They're natural. They're fresh foods. And to me, wild edibles constitute that. Wild edibles are also local food. And this is something that's very important. Local foods, foods that grow where you grow, have to deal with the same climate and same bacteria and same microbes as you do. So for example, if I eat a dandelion from Coeur d'Alene, where I'm growing up, that dandelion is going to be acclimated to that climate and is going to help boost my immune system so I won't get the flu as easily. So I won't get you know, headaches or stomach aches. It's more adapted to that climate and it's going to make you more adapted to that climate. The other benefit, other huge benefit in eating local food is that you don't spend those huge resources, you know, the Earth's finite resources to get the food. You know, like the average banana, I think, travels something like 3,000 miles to get from where it was grown to you. So in some instances, bananas actually travel more than humans, right? Like, there's probably some people even here today that Maybe I've never been 3,000 miles away from Coeur d'Alene, and yet that banana has flown all over the world. And I've witnessed this firsthand, and I've been kind of shocked by this, that when I go to New Zealand, for example, the only apples I get there were grown in Washington. <laughs> and I've always heard that, oh, you know, New Zealand has kiwis that are so good. Can you buy a New Zealand kiwi in New Zealand? Nope. Because... Somewhere else in the world, they pay a higher dollar for that kiwi, so New Zealand grows those kiwis and exports them. When I lived on Maui, I couldn't buy a Maui-grown pineapple because they're world-renowned, so the same thing. They, they harvest them and they ship them elsewhere. If I bought a, a, Maui, or a pineapple on Maui, it was likely from Costa Rica. Isn't that crazy? I mean, if I, like, the only way I could get a pineapple that was grown in Hawaii would be to go to the field at night and steal one because nobody would sell me one. So wild edibles grow right there and the only energy expended is your own, right? You go and pick it, which also happens to be exercise, another benefit. Let's see, where are we? Food diversity, that's a huge thing that wild edibles give us. If you've ever read Omnivore's Dilemma, Michael Pollan writes about how the average American, and I would even go as far to say the average human citizen, I don't want to just pick on Americans, because in Europe, same problem, in Russia, same problem. The average person eats about 30 different types of food per year. That's not that many, actually. And you might think, oh, I, I have a very diverse diet because Yesterday I ate some pasta, and the day before that I ate some pizza, and then after that I, I ate a casserole, and then I ate some cake. You know, that, that's a lot of stuff. But the building blocks for that stuff is corn, sugar, wheat, potatoes, meat. It's 30 of the same ingredients. And so when you eat those ingredients repeatedly, you're limiting the amount of nutrition that you can intake. 
And I think that th that is part of the reason why allergies are becoming more and more of an issue in the modern age, is because we, our bodies just get too much of certain substances, too much wheat. When your parents ate wheat and then they bring you into this world and you eat wheat all the time, it's feasible that you might one day become allergic to wheat. Another guy, Daniel Mormon, he's an ethnobotanist who re researches the diets of native people. And he writes that Native Americans traditionally used thousands of different plants per year, up to 4,000. So here we were on one end of the spectrum using 4,000 plants, huge, right, to 30. And we all know that, for example, if you eat celery and cucumbers and carrots, they all have slightly different nutritious content, right? So wouldn't it make sense that if we ate more diversely, we would have a better chance of getting more nutrition? I really spent a lot of time pondering the concept of eat a balanced diet, eat a diverse diet. You know, we, we're all kind of taught that in elementary school, and at least I was anyway, and they'd always point to this little food pyramid and they'd say, eat a balanced diet. And I thought about that a lot over the years, and I thought that maybe the first person who said, eat a balanced diet, was standing out in a field and kind of went, eat a balanced diet. Eat from the grasses, eat from the bushes, eat from the trees, eat from the mountains. If you're by a lake, eat from the stuff that grows by the lake. Eat some blue-green algae, maybe. Could that be? I don't know. I like it. So wild edibles give us a ton of diversity. For example, if you learn one plant, dandelions, which I'm sure most of you already know, they have roughly 300 edible relatives. So by learning one single plant, you can go from eating 30 different types of food to 330. It's that easy. The other thing about wild edibles is that they grow in not depleted soil. Even our organic farms, the best organic farms, in order to survive, they got to grow the same crops in the same soil. And, you know, if you're lucky, that farm will sometimes rotate some soybeans in there to put some nitrogen back into the soil. But the soil is more or less depleted. Whereas if you harvest a dandelion growing from a park or some uh, wilderness, it's likely not been overused. And so there's going to be more minerals in the soil. On that same subject, wild edibles often have longer root systems, so even if the topsoil is depleted, they can penetrate deeper and draw out more minerals. For this reason, you may have noticed that sometimes in the summer when all the grass dies because you, don't, you haven't been watering in it enough, dandelions will remain green. Have you ever noticed that? Is it because there's some kind of secret Coeur d'Alene superhero that runs around at night watering only the dandelions? I think not. It's those long roots. And if you ever tug on a dandelion, it's very tough to pull it out of the ground. So long roots, more minerals. I'm kind of skirting around the fact, that probably the best, biggest benefit is that they're free, right? Wild edibles are free. And let's face it, food costs a lot. I recently saw this little uh, news clip from Mint.com. The average American spends $580 on food and drinks every month. I would say that I spend more than that. Because the average person goes to the store and they spend $42 of buying groceries. I can never go to a health food store without spending more than 80 or less than 80 right? You buy a couple items and pretty soon you're like, whoa, that's a lot of money. Average restaurant visit, 29 bucks. All that accumulates. I've been living for the last two years in Montana, and during the winter, you can't really do a lot of edibles. But during the summer, it's so bountiful that 70 or 80% of my diet is free. I'm not kidding you. I go out and I harvest purslane, and I uh, dry and I freeze it, and I put it into crackers, I put it into my smoothies. The bulk of my diet is free. Isn't that amazing? I mean, a bunch of kale can cost six bucks depending on where you are and what season it is. 
You go to a local organic farm and you say, hey, I know you have an edible weed problem. How much would it cost me to pick some of your weeds? And they just laugh at you and they say, that's funny. We should be paying you for picking our weeds. Right? <laughs> that's an endless amount of greens that you can have in your diet for free. The other thing is it exposes us to nature. And that's becoming more and more of an issue in, in the society we live in, especially for kids. There's great books written about it. One is called Last Child in the Woods. Anybody ever seen that title? It's basically saying that kids don't spend time outside anymore. And as I'm looking around, you know, everybody, the, the bulk of the people here seem to, like they're 30 and above. You guys are kind of the last generation. I'm kind of the last generation that grew up without the internet, without a huge amount of video games. We were the last generation that played outside. And the thing about playing outside is that there's natural benefit to just being out there. When you look at a landscape or an ocean or a lake or put your bare feet on grass, your heart rate and cholesterol go down. Your mind relaxes. You're able to de-stress. This is scientifically proven, many cases, versus a city or TV or the internet, your cholesterol goes up. Today's children are spending more than a, I, I think the statistics right now are, are uh, that, that today's kids between the ages of 9 and 12 spend 32 hours watching TV every week. That's more than a day of television every week. And if you factor in Computers, internet, video games, it's sometimes as high as 48. While at the same time, less than 6% of those same 9 to 12 year olds spend time outside every week. And you know, I, I think technology is exciting. I like my iPhone and I like computers and the bulk of the work that I do, I work with a camera or, you know, upload that stuff to the internet. And I think that. I'm a realist, and I don't, I'm not saying we should just scrap that and go and play out in the woods. But I do notice that when I balance my digital life with my natural life, I feel a lot healthier. Like, my, I'm mentally more at ease. And it's very important for you guys to feel that way, and also if you have kids or know people with kids, to also instill that back into them, how important it is. Remember the 90s, anybody? Do you remember how, when you didn't have cell phones, how exciting it was to make plans with somebody and actually show up? <laughs> and then you actually remembered everybody's phone number, and, and oftentimes you met in an outdoor setting, and you actually went on walks together? That was fun, right? We're going to do some of that today. And finally, the last benefit I want to discuss, there's bountiful benefits. I'm sure you could come up with hundreds more yourself. But the harvesting wild edibles is one other way that you can connect with your friends and your loved ones. And that's just nice. You know, when you're harvesting plants, if you have kids, make sure you, you bring them along and you learn together. It's like just a great opportunity for family time. So now I've listed off some benefits of eating weeds. Maybe a lot of them you already knew, knew about or considered. But you're all here to learn about wild edibles, so my guess is that you don't do it regularly. Can I ask you why? Why don't we eat wild edibles? We don't know them. We don't know what to pick. All right, so you don't know them. You don't know what to pick. Oh, I love it. Okay, so how many people saw the movie Into the Wild or read the book? We don't want to end up like that guy, right? The media is full of those examples where so-and-so goes outside, he eats a plant, and then he just dies, keels over dead. And it's so sad because he was so young and yada, yada, yada. I think it's good to have fear because fear prevents us from kicking the bucket, right? Unfortunately, I think all of us are, in, are instilled from a very early age that nature can kill you. Like if you think about your first experience in nature, maybe you were this little kid who was walking around 
and you were just exploring. And back then, as a little toddler, you don't just explore with your eyes. You feel stuff. You listen. Nothing has labels yet, so it's really exciting. You come up to bushes and trees, and you feel them, and you smell them. And then you, you do the next step. You pick something, and you're about to put it in your mouth. And then mom or dad runs up and maybe smacks you on the back of the head and says, don't eat that. It's poisonous. Does mom or dad really know if it's poisonous? Probably not in most cases. They just say that to deter their kid. Now, I don't blame them at all. I, I think it's better to be safe than sorry. But the side effect of that is that people start fearing the natural world. And then movies like Into the Wild reinforce that, that nature is dangerous. And then, you know, we grow up believing that. Why the heck would we ever want to conserve it if it's out to get us? I conducted research as to how many poisonous plants there were, and I was shocked. There are relatively few. If you go to the poison control website, they list about 150 plants that are poisonous. Versus the hundreds, if hundreds of thousands of plants out there that can be eaten. In North America alone, excluding mushrooms and lichens and other things, there are over 40,000 plants that have been classified. You know, there's probably 10,000, 20,000 more that haven't been classified. Out of those, 150 are classified as poisonous. Now, I looked into the, the concept of poisonous, and it gets kind of murky. Depends on which expert you talk to classifies poisonous differently. So, for example, if you talk to a Native American expert, they say nothing is poisonous. If you know the proper dosage, the proper part to eat, and the proper season, then nothing is poisonous. But then you talk to a toxicologist, and he says, are you kidding me? Everything is poisonous. If you Google poisonous plants, for example, apples come up, cherries come up, coffee, beer. I took these mushrooms yesterday, and I think they're puffballs. Could uh -huh. you tell me if they're good? No? Can we save that till later? Oh, okay. I just wanted to see if they're good or not. Uh, so basically, there's this, these two conflicting theories about what is poisonous, what is not. I tend to side with Native Americans because I think that most food has small quantities of poisons, of alkaloids, that are in there engineered to prevent us from eating one food every single day all year long, right? In fact, if we live close to nature, this would be impossible because things are in season for a short amount of time. I could eat kale for as long as it was spring and summer, and then the kale would go away, and I'd have to eat nuts or acorns or something else until uh, the seasons changed again. So if you look at food from the point of a toxicologist, they look at all the different elements within food, and of course they're going to find poisonous elements. That's why they classify cherries and apricots and almonds and beer and coffee poisonous. That's also why we have livers and kidneys, because they process those small quantities of poisons out, and we're able to live without any negative side effects. Interestingly enough, in small quantities, a lot of these elements actually help our bodies. Like, for example, the arsenic found in apple seeds explodes cancer cells. Now, if you ate a whole bucket of apple seeds, that might not serve your body. But if you eat an apple with its seeds, that actually does good things to you. So I tend to side more with Native American culture that says there's more edible plants than poisonous ones, but I'm never silly about it. I'm never, I never eat stuff if I don't know what it is, if I haven't positively identified them. And we'll get into that momentarily. But basically, I just want to say that plants themselves can't harm you. They don't jump down your throat because they're evil, right? You actually have to pick a plant, put it in your throat, and then you get harmed. So it's because of lack of education or maybe 
uh, laziness that people like into the wild happen. And also, if you look deeply into that story, uh, the guy actually didn't poison himself at all. He starved to death. He wasn't getting enough calories for a very long time, and over, over a long period of time, actually ended up starving to death. Openly published that, but the author didn't like that story. It wasn't as fun, so he made some stuff up. So the bulk of people who get poisoned take unknown plants, put them in their mouth. And we're not going to do that ever, right? Let's get into some basic ground rules, then we'll summarize this, uh, pack up, and then head to Cherry Hill. Sound good? I have four basic rules for wild edible harvesting. The first one is don't eat something if you don't know what it is. Seems like common sense, right? Just don't eat it. You see a flower, even if it looks brilliant and you want it in your salad, if you don't know what it is, just leave it alone. Maybe take a picture of it or take a physical sample, bring it home and identify it. And then, if you know that it's edible, you can go ahead and eat it. Rule number two, don't mix different edibles. So for example, uh, I, Sergei told me that, I'm talking in third person here, you've got to excuse me, but Sergei told me that miner's lettuce, dandelions, and purslane were all edible. So I'm going to throw them in a smoothie or in a salad and eat them. Because wild edibles are going to be new foods to you, you want to approach them as though they are potentially going to cause an allergic reaction. So eat them one at a time until you are absolutely sure that your body acts, reacts positively to them. And on that same note, rule number three is eat things for the first time in small quantities. So just because I tell you that dandelions are edible, again, you're going to come, you're going to approach new foods and you want to do it slowly to make sure that your body reacts positively to them. As adults, we don't really ever experiment with food. That's why we figure out what we're allergic to as kids, because things are new back then. And then we kind of get in our little comfortable path and we stay there. And so when we go out to forage, we're actually going to kind of unravel that comfortability. We're actually going to experience unfamiliar stuff. So eat things in small quantities. And then rule number four is a bigger rule. It's kind of like getting back to your childhood roots. It's engage all of your senses. And our senses, again, are what? There's five of them. Sight, sound, smell, taste, and hearing. If I were to put number them one through five, one being the sense I'd use first and five being the sense I'd use last, which would taste be? Last. Last. One would be look, sight, right? That's the thing that extends furthest from our body. We see things, and everything communicates non-verbally, non right? So if I look at this wall, I don't need to smell it or touch it or eat it. It's communicating to me, I'm hard. If you eat me, you'll chip your teeth. So automatically, a lot of things get eliminated, like that stainless steel counter and even you know, that green water bottle. That looks green, and I like greens, but my eyes tell me that it's hard. The next sense that I would use is touch. What does it feel like? And some, some leaves are very tender, and other leaves are very cardboard-like. Maybe something's confusing, and you, by just looking at them, you're not sure if they're hard or pleasant or what. You can actually come over and feel it, right? So sight, touch, smell. What does it smell like? Some plants smell very pleasant, and when you crush them up, you're actually going to start salivating. Often, that's a really good sign. Other plants, like hemlock, which we'll actually encounter today, if you were to smell it, it smells kind of repulsive. And so you, you want to get away from it as fast as, you, as possible. Some plants have a very strong chemical smell. And even some flowers that might smell absolutely delicious or fragrant, you can kind of tell 
it's not edible. It's just too much aroma in this thing. Next is hearing. Native Americans say, listen to the plant. This might sound really silly because, like, what is it going to say? It doesn't have a mouth. But I could tell you this, that when we were hiking for six months, we got so in tune with nature that we would notice certain things we never would have living in a city. Like, for example, we were always tuned in to what the weather would be like. We didn't have any weather person to tell us the rain was coming, but we would notice certain things in the air, like some static would build, or like maybe the hair on my arm would stand up when there was going to be a thunderstorm or when it would freeze at night. In that same manner, we would also kind of deduce what was likely edible and what was poisonous. So in a way, the plant was communicating. I also like to interpret this as uh, hear your surroundings. Like, for example, is there a road near where you're harvesting? Because automobiles often imply pollution. Do you hear anybody mowing the lawn or anybody spraying? You know, be, hearing is being aware of your environment. All things important to consider. And finally, the last sense is the sense of taste. Where you're going to take a little piece and you're not just, you're not just going to gorge yourself full of this unknown edible or, what, or this known edible. You're going to take a little piece and you're going to rub it on your lip. Or maybe take a tiny little piece and put it under your tongue because those areas are super sensitive. And if you have any kind of allergic reaction, just rubbing it on your lip will keep it to a minimal. That's what my dad did with the celery originally. He ate a tiny little piece. And even if we had been terribly mistaken and that was hemlock, for example, that tiny little piece on your lip wouldn't kill you. You'd actually need to eat a lot of it. So if you follow all four of those pretty simple common sense rules, that ensures 99.99999% safety, I think. I mean, I've been doing this now for over 10 years, and I'm still alive. So the last thing I want to mention before we uh, pack it up is that the environment plays a huge uh, role in wild edible harvesting. As foragers, you're going to have to be aware of your surroundings. And I'm not as concerned about plant poisons as I am about man-made poisons. Humans have made a lot of chemicals, and those chemicals are much more harmful than a wild edible or a plant that could give you a stomach ache or a headache, for example. When we live in cities and when we deal with these man-made poisons, we have to be very careful. One thing I've come into, uh, one thing I do often is I call the Parks and Rec Service, and I kind of just say, hey, I would like to get an idea of where you guys spray and where you don't. And they're, they're very helpful. They're, they divulge that information quite a bit. One thing the recession has been awesome for is that it's cut all the budgets for spraying parks and stuff, so woo, I <laughs> love it. It's a good idea to not harvest near roadways. You can safely harvest near a road, but you've got to give yourself enough distance from that road. I think that safe distance is 70 to 100 feet. And also use uh, common sense there, too. Like, for example, if you're, the road is on a hill, and I see, like, miner's lettuce growing near the road, I would go uphill instead of downhill, right? Because if it rained, the car runoff would go downhill. I do think that it, you can harvest wild edibles in a city safely. And by nature, weeds, edible weeds, help draw out pollutants from our bodies. So if you happen to get some chemicals in your system, it'll likely work itself out. But it's good to think about these things when you're going in so that you, may, you stay as safe as possible. Sound good? So maybe I'll just answer some uh, questions briefly, and then we'll go. Any questions on what I've talked about thus far? Yeah, what, what do you um, feel about, like, you know, picking the plant and parasites and things like that? Do you have any comment on that? 
Can you be more specific about parasites on the plant? I mean, if you're, if, to me, I've been taught that you know you're always supposed to wash. Mm -hmm. you know, your your produce and things that you eat. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you, you asked that question. That's a very good question. So in my own practice, depending on how far out and how pristine the area is, like for example, if I'm backpacking, I never wash what I pick because I feel pretty certain that it's as clean as it's going to get. Now some people in the past have said, well, how do you know that an animal hasn't peed on it or whatever? And I can't be totally certain. And if, if I'm ever in doubt, I will rinse it in a stream. But I like to turn that question around and say, hey, well, how can you be certain that a deer didn't pee in your cabbage patch, you know? Animals are all over the place. Parasites can't live in a healthy body. Basically, parasites, why is it that there's microbes and bacteria all around us and yet we're still kicking? Because they eat dead matter, right? So somehow they have this way of figuring out what is dead and what is living. That's why if you eat good food, you never have stuff fermenting in your stomach and your intestines. Parasites won't be as big of an issue because things are constantly moving through you quickly and there's nothing for them to eat. So my mom has a really great chapter on bacteria in her book, 12 Steps to Raw Food. I should also mention that I'm moving back to Oregon in two days and uh, I don't really want to take any of my books with me because my car is full as it is. So everything's 50% off. And if you buy $30 worth of books, you get a free DVD and CD. But that'll be my only plug for today. Um, what's your, have you ever looked into about the theory of, of macro diets where you should mix fruits and vegetables? And you know, do you have any information on that? I've looked into that a bunch, and what I've realized, I'm guessing you're uh, implying the f like the fruit smoothies and greens and stuff? Yeah. Kind of. Green leafy vegetables are actually not vegetables. Uh, so you may, may have heard don't mix fruits and greens and fruits and vegetables together because some are starchy, some are sweet, and then fermentation happens in your stomach. Greens are not vegetables. Greens are actually uh, more resemblant of flowers. They don't have starch in them. Uh, they have a very low sugar content. And so if you know just that little piece of information based off those same food charts, I'm not actually contradicting anything. If you make a smoothie that has beets and apples, for example, then you might have some uh, gas or some discomfort in your stomach. But blending green leafy vegetables, things like lettuce and kale and mint with sweet fruit is actually a good combination. Have you shared your, your favorite wild edible smoothie? Oh gosh. So everybody, some, I get that question a lot. What's your favorite recipe, wild edible smoothie or not? It's kind of whatever's in season. I really try and diversify my diet as much as possible so that I'm not eating the same stuff over and over again. In fact, Sometimes in my classes, I give smoothie samples, and people love it so much that they go home and they make that kale, banana, mango smoothie for three months every single day. And then they run into that problem where uh, the alkaloids from the kale build up, and your body just wants some other kind of green, some other ingredients. Uh, and then they start feeling stomach aches, that kind of thing. So I don't have a particular green smoothie recipe that's my favorite, but currently miner's lettuce is very much around and thriving. So I've been doing miner's lettuce with some apples and pears. And that's been treating me really well. Chickweed. Well, I noticed the pears in the store right now are pretty darn hard. Mm -hmm. will, they, will they get ripe or do you take them home and do them on the counter or do you, she shouldn't eat them green, right? Yeah, it's better not to eat things unripe, and that's kind of the tricky part we get into up in the northern territory, because food has to get picked so green before it gets here that they pick it sometimes six months before it's ready. Unfortunately, that fruit doesn't often ripen. In fact, I bought some kiwis at Costco. I should have known better. As hard as they were at Costco, a month later, they're, they pretty much went from hard to rotting. 
And uh, so that's unfortunate, but we're also moving into a really bountiful season where we can fill our bodies with nutrients and weather <laughs> another cold winter. Yay. <laughs> You know, I've never been to Cherry Hill before today. I went and did like a little small tour, so this is going to be as exciting for me as it will be for you. And on that note, I also want to mention that I do this uh, because I f it makes me feel good. Some people consider me an expert. I still am learning a ton. And because I've learned mostly in Oregon and Montana, there might be some plants I'm not familiar with. And so I'll, I will not lie to you, and I'll, I'll say, hey, I, I don't know what that is. I have to research it more. But today will be exciting for me, just as it will be for you. You mentioned weight loss. What do you do to diversify your diet? What I've been doing the last couple years in Montana is uh, preparing like kind of like a squirrel <laughs> during the summer months. I have some dehydrators. I've been doing lamb's quarters and purslane, making them into crackers, actually drying vegetables in a dehydrated soup so that when it's winter time I can take a little bit of warm water, throw about a half a cup of those veggies in there, a little bit of olive oil, some salt, and it makes a nice warm soup. I've also uh, taken little chickweed flowers, I've thrown them into ice cube trays, and then I have little ice infused with flowers. Dandelions are incredible in pesto, so you can make pine nuts, dandelions, basil, garlic, lemon juice, pesto, and freeze it. Pine nuts are super expensive, so you can actually replace them with walnuts, and it works just as good. And just little things like that. I uh, dry and freeze a lot of stuff. That helps. I bought a 60-gallon deep freezer where uh, I freeze wild edibles. And also, around town, there's a lot of... Um, abandoned fruit trees. It, it, this is hilarious, I think, kind of, is that in Missoula, I found that there's apricots, there's pears, there's apples, and there's cherries growing in people's yards, and they don't want them because they have a tiny little brown spot on them. They'll actually leave those apples to rot on the ground and then go to the store and buy apples for $3.99 a pound. And during one of these uh, little <coughs> gleaning ventures, I knocked on this lady's front door because she had beautiful apples. And I was like, do you mind if I pick some of your apples? I'm happy to even kick, kick down a few dollars, you know? And she was like, oh, why would you ever want them? They're full of worms. I didn't tell her that that was just a little extra protein, but <laughs> I was like, well, you know, I'll just cut around the worms. I'm going to dehydrate most of them. And she was like, oh, take as many as you want. She ac she'd never tried her own apple. She just assumed they were horrible. So I dried some of these apples, and I figured it would be nice to kind of give back to her. So I brought her a, a little bag of apple slices. I gave them to her, and now every time I run into her in Missoula, she's like, my apples are so good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I didn't just mess up my <laughs> hookup for apples, right? She's, what did you do with my apples, right? Exactly. Same thing with apricots. There's an insurance agency, downtown Missoula, that has a huge apricot tree with the best, most tasty apricots. They fall in the parking lot. They really hate them because cars drive over them and ruin the lot. So I came out there, I picked 100 pounds, and they were ready to hire me to like, <laughs> you know, sweep their apricots, and I got 100 pounds of apricots out of them. So if you just walk around the, the neighborhoods and the alleys, uh, there's a, a ton of food just growing. And, that's kind of another side project I've been working on is edible gardens. Actually, uh, developing this concept of planting fruit trees in public parks so that if anything ever happened, if people were down and out, they could actually go and feed themselves. And interestingly enough, I was just in Australia last year, and that's what they're doing. They're actually starting parks within Perth and Sydney that have fruit trees and different edibles growing so that people can go and eat. All right, well, er, all of the, of the other questions I'll answer in the field. Thank you so much for being inside with me on this Saturday. I think we're meeting people there at 1, which gives me about a half an hour that I can pack up, and we'll just head to Cherry Hill.